Hi, this is Kendrick with worldmedicalschool.org. We're going to go over the primary trauma survey. So trauma is the leading cause of mortality worldwide, and uh, it's pretty high up in the U.S. as well. It's the leading cause, I believe, in ages uh, 15 to 35. So lower morbidity and mortality in trauma centers, which I think is partly due to education. So let's be educated here. So we remember the mnemonic A, B, C, D, E. Let's go over what each of these letters means. So airway, we're talking about assessing and protecting the airway. How do you assess an airway in a conscious victim? Uh, you ask them uh, a question and see how they respond. Generally, talking is a good uh, indicator of, of airway patency, but you're also going to want to assess if they have impending uh, impending compromise to their airway. So if there's any reason that you think that there might be increasing swelling or bleeding in the area that might uh, compromise the airway, that's another thing that we're assessing for. And we're going to try and figure out if they need to be intubated. We can give just O2 if, if they uh, don't need an intubation. But if they are hemodynamically unstable, if they're comatose, uh, if they've got uh, blood or uh, trauma to the oropharynx, if they have a fractured larynx or trachea, those are all good reasons for intubation. Now the next question is, when do we do a surgical airway? Well, I showed this to an ER doc the other day, and when he saw failed intubation, he kind of laughed at me because he says that he never does a surgical airway because of failed intubation. I don't know if that means that he always, if he's good at intubation, so he doesn't uh, ever have to, but some people say two to three failed in intubations may be an indication for a surgical airway. Uh, certainly, uh, maxiofacial trauma that uh, renders you unable to intubate and significant bleeding into the oropharynx would be good reasons to do a surgical airway. And on that note, we mentioned this in the neck uh, penetrating trauma video, but when you do an intubation, be prepared to uh, do a, a surgical airway at the same time, so just in case it doesn't go well. Uh, maintaining cervical st stabilization is important in most trauma victims, but uh, remember that it, it is uh, more immediately deadly to them to not get oxygen to their brain than it is to hurt their spine. So, so you don't uh, you don't let moving the the head around uh, get in the way of getting them an airway. On that note, uh, it is shown to be pretty safe to have somebody uh, stabilize the head for you and just extend it and uh, while you put an airway in. So don't be too worried about doing that. Breathing. Uh, you want to auscultate the chest, you want to do a pulse oximeter and try and figure out if they are getting enough oxygen. The main things that we want to rule out are pneumothorax, uh, both tension and open, hemothorax, flail chest, and cardiac tamponade. Those are some of the most immediately deadly uh, problems with breathing. And we're going to go through a couple of them here. So tension pneumothorax. We remember the signs include absent breath sounds, uh, shock, hypoxemia. Some of these uh, will, will have some EKG findings as well and certainly x-ray findings. But remember, this is our primary trauma sur survey, so we're going to try and identify a tension pneumothorax before it uh, causes death. And uh, so if we auscultate the chest, we don't hear breath sounds, they have some respiratory distress, and any, any sign of trauma to the chest, uh, then we want to go ahead and do a, a needle thoracostomy as our initial uh, our initial treatment of the tension pneumothorax. So uh, you can use a 14 gauge needle or bigger. Uh, I also saw 16 gauge needle. You go to the second intercostal space at the midclavicular line. And uh, 
stick that needle in. We'll talk about uh, chest tubes in a second because that's your next step. Hemothorax, um, it just uh, implies blood in, uh, in the uh, chest cavity and it can also compromise breathing as well as uh, cardiac function. So chest tubes, which are both treatment for uh, hemothorax and pneumothorax, we use a thoracostomy tube. You make an incision at the mid-axillary line uh, at the fifth intercostal space. You go up just above the rib. Remember, there's the, the nerves and vessels that, that run just below ribs, so you go just above the rib. And uh, you make, make sure you get a generous incision. Sounds like that's the main thing that people run into is they don't have enough room to work in. So you get a, a pretty big incision, and then you're going to use your finger to guide that tube in there. And uh, you want it in the anterior superior area for, uh, for a pneumothorax. Pleurovac, I don't really know much about. Sorry. Flail chest is when you have three or more ribs uh, broken in multiple spots. And you notice paradoxical motion here because... Remember, the uh, pressure on the inside is going to pull uh, is going to pull those ribs in if they are not uh, fixed. So, when you're breathing in, usually your chest moves out, but you might have uh, your chest going in while you're breathing in in some spots. Uh, circulation. We want to control bleeding with direct pressure. We want to assess for circulation by uh, palpating pulses. Of course, we'll, we're going to be getting a we're going to be getting vital signs, but in a pinch, uh, if you palpate the carotid, that means that you have at least 60 millimeters mercury. The femoral, at least 70. If you can get a radial, you have at least 80 systolic. So, those are just some rough numbers to give you an idea of how much pressure they have. Uh, vascular access is very important here. Uh, most trauma, uh, trauma victims are going to get uh, two large bore IV needles in the antecubital fossa even before you get to this step. So depending on uh, what kind of a center you're working in, if you're in a trauma center, you have a whole team working on multiple things at the same time. So you get your A, B, C, D, E all at the same time. In uh, you know a smaller hospital, you may be going step by step through this and the vascular access might come a little bit further down the line than normally. So you can also do a femoral catheter, you can use the right subclavian uh, if you can't get good access. Uh, pericardiocentesis may be necessary if you have signs of uh, um, hemopericardium and uh, eorthoricotomy Sounds like this is a little bit of a debated procedure here. Um, I'll post a video for ER thoracotomy here so you can you can see what that looks like. I don't know if this is the way that they do it over here, but the video is uh, some Asian country. I'm not sure where, and uh, it's it's a pretty pretty intense procedure. But basically, you're getting access to the heart so you can, uh, in some circumstances, repair. Uh, myocardium. If you have, uh, for example, a stab wound to the heart, you can also clamp great vessels. Uh, that you can do clamp the descending aorta, so we make sure that we are not going to exsanguinate, and we're still getting blood to the brain. So those are some things you might do on in an ER thoracotomy. You you start your fluids. You give one to two liters isotonic fluids. Uh, that will roughly come out to 20 mils per kilogram. You recheck vitals after you give fluids, and then um, if still unstable, you can give some packed red blood cells. Uh, some other indications of blood loss that you can use are tachycardia, hypertension, tachypnea, oliguria, agitation, hematocrit, lactate, base deficit. What does that mean? I don't know. Disability. The Glasgow Coma Scale is something that is widely used, and uh, some studies have shown it's not uh, real effective in giving us uh, 
predictions of outcomes, but it's still still something to gauge somebody's uh, progress. So you get four points for opening your eyes spontaneously and uh, less if as you go down the line. Uh, five points for being oriented and uh, six points for obeying commands. So the Glasgow Coma Scale is out of 15 and uh, it will help you to decide uh, how good somebody's prognosis may be. Exposure. So in any trauma patient, you, you may not know what happened exactly and you need to disrobe the patient completely, uh, look for injuries everywhere, uh, assess for temperature status, wrap them in warm blankets. Uh, hypothermia is really common. Uh, in this same category, you talk about uh, keeping your fluids warm as well, making sure you uh, have a warm enough ER. Our next video is going to be about diagnostics and secondary uh, in our secondary trauma survey, so uh, you can look for that one next. Thank you for uh, our picture of hemothorax in an animal, uh, for um, our other pictures that we have here. And if you want to be involved, you can comment below to help us improve our videos, or you can go to worldmedicalschool.org backslash volunteer. Thank you.